What's up audit fans? I'm back and today we're looking at designing internal controls. A big thank you to Charlene who wrote to me uh, through Facebook and said, oh look, I'd really love something about how to design internal controls. This isn't something that the auditor would normally do because when we design internal controls for our client, we actually create a self-review independence threat. But if you're an internal auditor or you're providing some recommendations or if you're studying and it's quite a common question to be asked what sort of internal controls should be used to minimize a particular risk, today I'm going to address it with a four-step process. Let's get into it. Hi, and welcome to Amanda Loves to Audit. My name is Amanda, I do love audit, and uh, I'm really excited to be here back again on my YouTube channel. We're just starting our university semester here in Australia, so it's full steam ahead from me, really, really busy. But I wanted to give a shout out to all of my returning viewers from places like Canada, Indonesia, Namibia, Nigeria, South Africa, USA, Germany, Uganda, did I say Uganda twice? No, Ghana. It's really amazing. Uh, somebody in the comments asked if I'm Malaysian and I'm not. So my parents are both from China in the Guangzhou region of China. I don't speak any Chinese. So my parents came here, my mum came here when she was five years old. My dad came in his teenage years. And when my mum was growing up, she went to kindergarten not knowing any English. So when she talked with an accent, she received a lot of bullying, uh, even then, you know, a lot of racism against Asians. So when she had kids and we were the only Asian kids in our school, she said, I want you to sound Aussie. I want you to be able to blend in so that if you can sound like everybody else, then um, you know, hopefully you won't experience the same levels of racism and discrimination that she experienced as a child growing up. And so when I was, I think, three or four years old, my mother said to my grandmother, uh, who she looked after us a lot, she said, look, that's it. We're not speaking any Chinese anymore, English only. So I really only know enough Cantonese to get by at Yamcha. I know that I want to eat ha gao, cha siu baos, um, pai guat, dan tarts. I know that I don't want to eat the fung jiao, which is the chicken foot, <laughs> but really that's the extent of uh, my Chinese language skills. So that's enough about me. I've been a, a tiny bit busy recently. Um, I've just won the National Teaching Excellence Award for the Business Economics Law and Related category. I'll have a video more on that a little bit later because I'm doing a big speech and a whole lot of other things. So I was really excited to receive that and all of you out there in YouTube land were a really big part of that as well. So I did a survey a little while ago asking about whether you thought the resources were high quality um, and some feedback and a lot of those quotes and a lot of those pieces of information made it into my application. So thank you so much to everybody that's out there that filled in that survey. Uh, for everyone who's new, welcome. I love audit. And you'll hear that, you'll see that in everything that we do. So I'm just gonna switch camera positions a little bit uh, so that then I can have my writing coming up here. So just hang on. So today we're getting into how do I design an internal control? It's a really common exam question just to see that you can do the other perspective. And if you're studying management accounting, how to design an internal control can be really important because management accounting is about Number one, doing accounting from within the firm, but also designing the management systems that make sure that everyone in the organization is working together, uh, moving in the same direction. There are gonna be four steps in our process. So step number one is going to be about identifying the potential misstatement. Now, the reason that we need to do this is that remember, a control is a response to a risk. So essentially we have to identify the risk. What is the potential misstatement, the potential error that could occur? So that's step number one. Then step number two, 
and I'm going to just move that up a little bit, is we have to ask ourselves the question, do we want to prevent the issue from happening or are we trying to detect an error afterwards? So in a lot of circumstances where it's a control around a process, I want to try and prevent, right? Prevention is always better than a cure. So you have to think, am I going to prevent or do I want to detect? Now, detecting is about picking up that there's a mistake perhaps after a process has happened. So you have a manufacturing process, you're making a good and then there is quality control. So, you know, you have everything in the process, the machines doing the right things, checking their parts and the quality control at the end is to make sure that you detect any issues before they go out, you know, the product goes out to the customer. So you have to think, do I wanna try and prevent or do I wanna try and detect? Now I'm gonna do this with a live example as well after. So I'm just gonna go through the theory first. So part one, identify the potential misstatements or what is the risk. Part two, am I thinking about preventing or detecting? Then you actually need to design an effective and efficient internal control. Now, what do I mean by effective? Effective, I mean that it has to work. It has to prevent the error that you've got. And when I say efficient, I mean that efficient is it's not going to cost us too much resources because remember when it comes to internal controls you have to think about the cost versus the benefit so in a supermarket to make sure that people don't steal from a supermarket i could make every single person have to go through an airport x-ray screening type of thing when they leave the store that would be very very beneficial however it would cost a lot in terms of time for my customers, effort to get it done, and also it would be really expensive, okay? So I need to balance the benefit of preventing or detecting a misstatement with the cost. So you gotta think about that in your design. Now, also when you're thinking about the design, you have to consider whether you want a manual control, so somebody physically doing something versus some sort of automated or IT or systems based solution, okay? Because if you do have something that needs a manual control, remember humans can make mistakes. With an automated system, you've gotta be really careful because if you don't program the system correctly, it can still make a mistake. So if you don't program it correctly, it could still go wrong. So our fourth thing that we want to think about is monitoring. All right, are we doing something to check the control? Essentially, we need to make sure that we are checking the operation of the control. Okay, a really great example of that monitoring aspect is if we have a bank and you go with your card and uh, I have one in my pocket actually. So here's my card um, for my bank account. I go to the ATM, I put it in, I get the pin wrong. Oh, okay, that's the wrong pin. Remember the right pin I put it in. The bank at the end of the day we'll get a report that says, what are all the cards where an incorrect pin was entered? Or perhaps an incorrect pin was entered more than three times, or we actually chewed up the card. So we wanna check that the control is operating effectively. We wanna check that the operation of the control is working, because remember, we know that when the control stops working, what happens? My regular viewers will know this. When the control stops working, then we have an increased risk of errors and misstatements. All right, and we definitely don't want that. We don't wanna have misstatements going into the financial 
um, record, records and the, the accounting of the firm. So to recap, I'm going to scroll quickly back up. Number one, identify the potential misstatements. Number two, decide whether you want to prevent or detect. Number three, design an effective and efficient internal control, thinking about the cost versus the benefit. That cost could be the time it takes, the dollars to actually implement it, the effort it might take. Think about whether you want manual or automated systems, and then consider the monitoring. What are we doing to monitor this control to make sure that it's always working? Is it if something goes wrong, a system flags with us? So now let's look at a practical example. So in my practical example, I'm going to think about a retail operation. And I'm using a retail operation because it's something that we can imagine in our minds. We've all been shopping to a store. Now I need to find something. Oh, let's just, I have a notebook here. So a big thank you to uh, Microsoft for, uh, they sent me a notebook the other day. I'm an MIE expert, which is a Microsoft innovative um, educator expert. And I got a little goodie bag for them includes a notebook. So say we're a retail operation and we're selling fancy notebooks. So let's say this is like, you know, it's leather and it's really fancy. So what is the risk? So let's start with step one. The risk is going to be theft of inventory. All right, if people steal the inventory, they're not buying it and we're not making revenue. So we've got our risk of misstatement is a theft of inventory. Um, and we might also have the, so let's talk about the, the theft of inventory risk. So then I have to think prevent or detect. So that's P or D. In this one, I definitely want to try and prevent theft. Okay, I don't want to detect the theft af after it's happened. I want to try and prevent people from stealing my item from my store. So prevent or detect. Now number three comes the actual part of designing the internal control. Well, I want something that will stop people from stealing my product. I've got a couple of different options here. And it might be that I might need to have multiple things in place. I could have security cameras, all right? But if I have security cameras, someone's gonna need to be watching them. So if I have security cameras, that could be a, a deterrent, potentially. I could also have RFID stickers on the inventory. All right, so an RFID sticker or one of those security tags. So uh, often it could be like a little sticker that's placed on an individual item or it could be a big removable tag. So if you've bought clothing from a department store, often those will have like a big tag on it that the sales checkout person will have to remove. So an RFID sticker or some sort of security tag or security tag. Now, given that this is a book, like a, a hole, I don't want to punch a hole in my notebook for the tag. So a little RFID sticker might be a good idea. And that's why a lot of stuff comes shrink wrapped in plastic. That is um, just so that they can then stick the RFID sticker on there. And it's come a long way. The old days RFID stickers were really expensive. Now I'm seeing supermarkets even use them on things like expensive meat products. So I've got my security cameras. I've got my RFID stickers. Um, I'm going to have, with the RFID sticker needed with that is going to be the RFID detectors at the store, whoops, can't spell store, entry exit. That is also why a lot of stores will only have one entry exit point so that they can put those big gates up. And often you will see those gates will be covered in advertising and things. So you don't notice that it's there. So you've got your RFID, your stickers, etc. The last thing that we might do is also a store bag check. All right. So that when you leave the store, they say, look, uh, can you open your bag? You know, bags of a bigger size to make sure that that's happening. So that's an example here for the fact that we've got our theft. Let's do another example. 
My next example is still going to go back to my notebooks, but my risk is going to be uh, the risk of charging the customer the wrong price. All right, and that is going to result for us in inaccurate sales. So that's affecting our accuracy assertion. Now, of course, in terms of prevention or detection, I want to try and prevent, okay? Then coming into the control. One thing that I could do, and I can remember the days where when you went to the supermarket, you didn't actually have barcodes. There was a little sticker that somebody manually added to the product and then you typed it in, into the cash register. So we could use barcode scanning, barcodes on goods and scan at the register. Okay, so that's gonna be my control. Now, in terms of the control, it's very cheap, it's efficient, you have to have obviously a cash register system, but the one thing that we wanna do here in terms of the monitoring, all right, is that we might wanna do something like check price overrides. All right, so if somebody tries to override the price, there's a couple of different options. You could have, you need manager, oops, that's meant to be an R, manager to approve any price overrides, or at the end of the day, you could have a daily report about those overrides. And that's really common in retail stores where they'll say, okay, give me the day end of day report. Oh yeah, this was overridden because this was damaged. This person had an extra discount. This was the manager's discretion. So you want to monitor how many prices were incorrect. Um, often there's also a thing that says, oh look, if the shelf says $5, but your thing says $10, you get whatever the shelf price is. So that could be one of your override codes. Now I realized back here when I was designing the controls for the risk of theft, then um, the, mo the store bag check um, could be one of those monitoring controls. So I realized I forgot there that I, I forgot to talk about the monitoring, but the store bag check could also be part of that monitoring process. I hope that that clarifies to everybody how you can design an internal control. And uh, remember to take it step by step. Think about the risk. Do I wanna prevent or detect? What are the control activities that I could do, automated or manual or with our systems or a combination of both? And then what am I going to put in place to monitor to make sure that control works properly? So I wanna thank you for watching this video. Of course, if you haven't already, consider subscribing. For all of those internal auditors out there, you might wanna check out Auditopia. It's a new internal audit community that I'm involved with. It has free resources that people are sharing, internal audit checklists and documentation. Um, and we've also got regular webinars to help you become a better internal auditor. I'm really excited to be part of the Auditopia team. I'll be working with them to create some content for some courses that they're going to have. Big thank you. I want everybody to stay safe, stay well. I've checked myself on the vaccination schedule. I'm hopefully going to be vaccinated in September or October of this year. So I'm really excited about that. But stay safe, stay well wherever you are, and I'll see you next time. <music>